So as I previously mentioned, uh, the forum is titled Leaders Predict the Future. Um, to that end, we're very fortunate to have as our lead speaker, Christopher Lee, a noted futurist and thought leader. I'm going to read part of his bio and then introduce him. But Christopher Lee is the president and CEO of CEL and Associates, based in the Los Angeles, California. Mr. Lee brings with him over 30 years of experience in strategic and long-range planning, performance improvement, compensation, and organizational development within the real estate industry. He has been a frequent contributor to national journals and a keynote speaker at conferences spo sponsored by the National Real Estate Associations and groups like ourselves. Mr. Lee has authored a 2012 book entitled Transformation Leadership and the New Age of Real Estate. I've read it, you need to read it, um, as well as a book titled From Good to Great to Best in Class. He has um, also co-authored a book on the development process for lodging facilities, and he has served on the advisory board for the business school and the real estate school at San Diego State University, and serves on the Metropolitan Research Center College of Architecture and Planning at the University of Utah. Mr. Lee has a PhD in management and organizational development. Please join me in, in a warm Richmond welcome for Christopher Lee. Good afternoon to everybody. Come on, this is Richmond. Good afternoon to everybody. All right, thank you very much. Um, it's great to be here at a time when real estate is in a, a period of transition, but more importantly, a period of transformation. Our industry is changing so rapidly that what you are doing today, what you think you're doing today, will not be what you're gonna be doing tomorrow. And today I'm gonna to go through an agenda of ways of presenting how you can think differently, an outlook of where I believe the real estate industry is going. I'm gonna start with the psychology of real estate, which is very important. I'm gonna to go to where are we in the real estate cycle? When is this cycle ending? When is the next cycle beginning? How long will that cycle last? What will drive those factors going forward? I wanna talk about the outlook for real estate in each of the sectors, the primary food groups, office, industrial, retail, and multifamily. And then I want to talk a little bit about an outlook for Richmond and more importantly finish up with some predictions that I want to make you think. Because it is a transformational time. I'm supposed to do all this in about 30, 40 minutes, so we're going to go pretty quickly. Those are like copies of my slideshow. You're welcome to come up afterwards. Give me a card. I'll be glad to email it to you. You can share it at your office. So let's get started here. Real estate is so much driven by psychology. And those of you remember in college, they had, there were classes, I know I didn't, I kind of slept through my psychology classes, but uh, Abraham Maslow had his own hierarchy of needs, you know, he become self-actualized and, and everything was great. And B.F. Skinner did some of those things. I've taken those studies and I've used them in terms of how we predict what's gonna happen in real estate. So there is a hierarchy of needs. In the hierarchy of economic hierarchy, you have from the bottom a recession, a recessionary economy, when that gets better, you're recovering economy, you're getting better, moving up the hierarchy chart. You become revitalized and you become robust. Pretty simple. In terms of real estate, there is another hierarchy that corresponds to that. When you're in the recessionary economy, basic necessity real estate always does better. And as the economy begins to recover and moves its way up, productive real estate, real estate that's being used more efficiently and more effectively, and then niche real estate, and ultimately discretionary real estate. Things like second homes and, and luxury malls and things like that are gonna fall up in that category. So if you take those two places, and then you say, well then how does it translate into what is going on in real estate? From a lowest perspective, when you have a recessionary economy, even recovering economy, what does well? Multi-family apartments always does well. Grocery, pharmacy, convenience retail, healthcare, and self-storage. And every single statistic you will read today shows that multifamily and those other asset classes I just talked about led the recovery coming out. Before we get up to the malls and some of the, the, the more discretionary income kinds of uses, the economy is gonna to have to improve. We're gonna to have to have discretionary income. We're gonna to have to have more jobs created. We're gonna to have to have higher incomes. All the things that need to occur for the demand in real estate to affect those asset classes. 
So real estate cycles, where are we? Well, interestingly, in real estate, it is a 10-year cycle. And every single real estate in the last 50 years has started on a three and ended on an eight, the last five decades. And if you begin to look at that, you begin to see, so where would we be in this transformation? And then the demand for a cycle is based on these primary drivers. So there's things like the government policies and procedures. That's where the Fed and that's where others can influence when we enter or leave a particular cycle. They can delay it, they can postpone it. But all those primary generators you see up on that slide there, each one of those, the consumer confidence, consumer spending, all those things, the job force, all the things that are happening will drive where we are in the cycle, will drive where you are in Richmond, will drive where you are in Virginia, will drive all of that activity. And because we work on those cycles that begin on a three and end on an eight, every single real estate cycle has a name. From 1983 to 1988, it was an awakening of boomers and entrepreneurism. This is when women entered the workforce in a massive way. This is when Trail McCrow, Gerald Hines, Paragon, Lincoln, Properties, you go down the list of companies who began to create their business models based on that transformation, based on that change of an incredible amount of baby boomers entering and active in the workforce. And then there was a four-year period of transition between one cycle ending and the next cycle beginning. The next cycle was an age of technology and startups. Real estate was driven by all those dot-coms, all those telecommunications. So places like Raleigh, uh, North Carolina, uh, Austin, Texas, Silicon Valley, Denver, many other places, Seattle, all were driven by much, much of the dot-com era. This is also the critical time for real estate because we lost so many young people to the startups because we fail as an industry to attract and retain young people at this time. So this is when they all began to move because they were giving, you know, yeah, yeah, stock options, you get here, you make a billion dollars. Oh, you wanna be a broker? Okay, here's a phone book, make calls, you know? I mean, it's just, where do you go, you know? And so as you look at that, this particular cycle is driven by that dot com era. And then it ended in 1998. The next one, was began in, in 2003, and we obviously had the 9-11 in there. It was an age of exuberance and debt. We borrowed like crazy. We spent like crazy. How many, just raise a hand, how many are boomers in this market, in, in the audience today? Just raise your hand if you're a boomer. Okay, look around, they're all to blame for the problem, okay? <laughs> Every one of those, they borrowed too much. But as we came out of that, what happened? What happened in the recession that happened in 1989? What happened in the recession, when did it occur? 2008, same thing, it ended on an eight. And as we began to see that, we take a four year period of recovery, we come out of that recovery in about 2012, 2013, and what was it? It was an age now of consequence and restructuring. This is when we are seeing portfolios being sold, reallocations of capital, we are seeing consolidation, we are seeing a rebalancing, we're seeing all these things happen because of that excess capital that was in the marketplace. So it's a resetting of the stage, resetting of the deck, you know? And as that happens, but what it begins to say is we're going to probably end, probably in 2018, could be 17 or 19, whatever, but it probably will end in a few years. We're in the seventh inning right now of where this typically is if you go back for the last 50 years. After that happens, in two, we have a four-year period of transition. In 2023, when all those boomers will be retired and in their chairs and they'll be drooling and whatever they're doing, you know, they're out of here, the young people will take over. And we will have an age of globalization. We will have an age of knowledge. We will use technology more efficiently. We will be far more dynamic. We'll be far more interactive than we are today. We could be far more, but many of the boomers are holding the young people back. But this will happen very quickly and it will affect the demand for the kind of assets that will be in place. By the time we get to 2020, 2033, all of us, at least for me on this room, I'll be toast, I'll be out of here. But as that begins to happen, what's going to drive real estate? Robotics and non-land-based environments. Water, the satellites, space, things that will change how real estate is now being played out. 
And so as this begins to change, what will be driving the economies, what will be driving jobs, what will be driving the demand for real estate, all based on these cycles. And what will happen right now in our, the cycle we're in right now, it is growing because of recapitalization, it is growing from generational shifts, the boomers getting older, the Y generation coming in maturity. It's growing from global restructuring. You know what's all going on over in Europe and China and Japan and elsewhere. Green technologies and all the things that are happening associated with that. Public infrastructure, knowledge center um, industries, all of that. We are moving, however, in America to a rental-based society. Everything we're going to is rental-based. And for young people today, just think of it. They come out of, out of high school, they go to college, they rent. They come out of college, they rent. They get their first job, they rent. They get married, they rent. They get their first divorce, they rent twice, okay? It happens very nicely. We love divorce, no, you're not. But it, it is a rental base. Zip cars, iTunes, you name it, Uber, all these things are rentals. And so society shifts its way in which we look at real estate from that perspective. And later on, those demands will be of life sciences and biotech. That's why we like STEM. We like STEM industries. We like those places that are on colleges and universities. We like places that are around hospitals and, and all the places that are going to drive this kind of massive data, massive scientific, massive way of thinking about knowledge. And that will affect real estate demand in every single community in this country. If you don't think, you say, well, Chris, okay, it sounds okay. Maybe I kind of, I, I'm getting it sort of. Show me the proof. Here's a couple of proof points. If you just take a look at cap rates from RCA, Real Capital Analytics, you can just see, boom, started up in about 2003, peaked up, down to eight, back up again. We're moving right back up to close to where we were on a volume transactional basis where we were before the last downturn. You take a look at commercial family loans. This came out of Mortgage Bankers Association. You can see the uptick, then boom, back down, 2008, moving its way back up again, slowly, but it's still moving its way back up. Another cycle. Reconstruction. Reconstruction, the people that, 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 that forecast reconstruction, data, the same thing. Falls down on eight, moves back up. Each one of these is moving in that direction. And probably the most telling one is the Moody's RCA uh, National Index of Real Estate. Look at where we are today as it compared to where we were back in 2000. You can see the cycle up, the cycle down in 2008, moving us back up. We are peaking and getting close to peaking now, which means we are going to be in the seventh inning of where things are. We've got another year or two or three, depending on the market and all what the government may, may screw around with. But at the end of the day, this is something we have to be very careful on because it's going to require you to think differently to go forward in the next cycle. Here's NAREIT index, Real Estate Investment Trust index. Look at the two low points, 88, 2008. It just works. Proof point after proof point after proof point will show that. So then what happens? Look at what's changing. I'm going to show you what's changing in each of these sectors, and it is dramatic. In the office side, very clearly, we have baby boomers, Xers, Ys, and, and, and Zs, we call them. But if you look at what's happening here and go to the far right-hand side, the old boomers, always the space was about 350 square feet per employee. And as we got to the Gen Xers, we started jamming them into, into cubes. We're dropping down to 250 square feet per person. We got down to the millennials. We were saying, you know what? You like all this group stuff. We'll work off of benches. We'll have shared offices. We'll do all this kind of stuff. And we're dropping down to less than 150 square feet per employee. This is why we're seeing leases being renewed, but not new space being taken. We're seeing how people are cramming more people and higher productivity in the same amount of space. CBRE and many others across the country have taken the lead in, in doing this and creating their own offices around this. But it is generational. Once those boomers retire, once they leave, <coughs> that space is being reused in a much smaller configuration. In San Francisco recently, the last five leases have been like 108, 112, 115, 116 square feet per employee. So as that changes, it means that why do I need an office the way it is today? By 2020, 46% of millennials will be in the workforce. These are the ones that want less than 150 square feet are used to working in smaller environments, much more connected. That changes how much demand there's going to be for office space. 43% will telecommute. Many of you commute, telecommute right now. You work from home. You work from home, you take a day off, you work at night, you do different things. All that begins to happen. 
Of the top 50 occupations that are fastest growing occupations in this country, only 10 of them require office space. So the demand in that particular sector is going to be very difficult. The average person, the average worker in office space spends 30% of their time working out of an office. And the individual space in a 24-hour day is lucky if it's occupied 55% of the time, which means their people are paying rent for the whole day and they're only using it less than half of the time. Why do I need to keep paying rent for space I don't use when rents may start to go up? We have excess supply of office. Now, I love office from one perspective. We have not built a whole heck of a lot of office space except for build a suits that are, that are occurring, which means that it's hard to replicate good real estate, good office buildings, and good locations. But because of this configuration, this asset class is going to stay slow for some period of time until it finally picks up again as, as the activities change. But we've shifted in, in, in office from, move, from managing four walls to managing inside the four walls. It's all about the workplace environment. It's about what environment we're going to use to attract, retain, and motivate our employees inside that space. Dedicated office on a sign. You can see it face-to-face meeting, going to Skype. All the things in that category means that things are changing dramatically in the office sector. And as that happens, you need to change your business models the way you change if you're a broker or a lender or a developer, whatever it is, because these changes have a material impact on the demand and use and success of this asset class. But there's no reason why those office buildings should be only occupied from 9 to 5 or 8 to 6. They are 24-7 buildings, and they're going to be start to be used 24-7 all the time because they're paying rent for 24-7. They're going to expect a different way of using that space. And those of you that have millennial kids, you know they sleep until noon anyway, you know, so they'll love working at 10 o'clock at night. I don't know. But the point of this is, is that it's changing and changing well, changing dramatically. Look at the deliveries. This is from CoStar. We are not delivering a lot of space, like I said. Therefore, what's going to happen? Rents are going to start to rise in office space later on when they can no longer cram people into 110, 125 square feet per employee. Then there's good demand going to increase. Rents are going to increase. And good assets and good locations will do very, very well. There's a cap rate. You can see that cycle again, ups and downs from there. You can see what's happening in Richmond, Norfolk, You know, ups and downs again, same old way. Office construction the same way, kind of moving slowly. Most of this is greening and conversions, redevelopment. Things are happening, even some mixed-use projects inside there. Industrial. Industrial is changing as well. We haven't been delivering as much space again on that, on that sector. It's going much slower. There's the cap rates again. You can see the ups and the lows. But right now, industrial is a very good, very hot commodity across the country in a lot of different places. But as that happens, much of that's going to be new green technologies, new technology with robotics, new ways of, 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 of uh, utilizing that space that right now much of the old stuff is not there. There's Richmond's numbers right there. You can see very, very effectively. And retail. Who's in retail today? Just raise your hand if you're in retail. God bless you. You're toast. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, copy his meal for him. Okay. Um, because retail is changing probably faster than any other asset class. It is clearly moving. <coughs> when you're a boomer, you trusted the brand. In millennials, they trust the experience. Millenni- uh, 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 boomers has food as a necessity. Millennials has food as a nutrient. Go down the list. What is it all there? Restaurants a place to eat. Restaurants a place to socialize. Restaurants a place to connect. Why do young people go to Whole Foods? It's, hey, it's where the chicks hang out. It's where you go out and meet people. You know, my, my daughter's the same way. She's in this group. You call her up on the phone. You say, what are you having for dinner? Oh, God, it's dinner. I've got to go find something. You know? It's like these kids don't think because everything seems to work much more on an instant experiential-based way of looking. So retail changes, so does the way, it, a way we're going to have to think. And technology is changing that dramatically. Right now, the... A retail, online retail sales are about 7 8% of sales. When they get to be about 15 20%, most of the retail models begin to collapse. And the reason for that is because people are using Amazon and everybody else to go out and buy their goods. And as that happens, what am I going to do with my retail? And there's a whole bunch of things that are happening there. We work with most of the big REITs in, in, in retail. And as we go through that, we're developing a variety of new models, new products, new ways of looking at retail to attract, retain, and extend that length of stay of that visitor coming in. 
but the consumer today in retail has taken a hold of the transactions. 81% of consumers go online before they go to a store to make a, make a major purchase. All of you have. All of you have. My wife did that the other day. I hate shopping. She takes me in the car. We should go buy a coat. We go out to Pasadena, which is a ways away from our house. She goes, she tries on the coat at Eddie Bauer. She tries on 10 different coats, right? She finds the coat they want. They says 300 bucks. I said, my wife says, don't worry about it. She takes her iPhone out, scans the barcode. We walk out to the car, she sits in the car. I got to, I'm ready to start the car. She said, no, no, don't start the car. She boop, 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 boop. She orders the coat, 150 bucks, next day delivery out of Vermont. Okay? Same stupid coat. But this is that guy over there in, over in, in Pasadena is wondering, what happened to my sale? This is what is changing the nature of how people buy and use goods through the internet from that. People comparative shop online. All of you go to ratings. You can say, what, what, what's the restaurant rating? Oh, it's a three star, it's a four star, it's a five star. Oh, no, I know, I don't wanna go there. Apartments have ratings, everybody's got ratings, okay? And so that happens, you make decisions based on that and you use your phone and smart technologies to do that. And that means that why do I need to go to a retail center? Why is that? And only 41% of millennials shop at a traditional grocery store. Each of them. So with that begins to happen, We've had changes in where retail is. This is our data again on the deliveries. We're not delivering at the volumes we used to deliver. We're over-retailed in many ways. We have to re-tenant, reprogram, redesign, reconfigure, add technologies to make those centers more viable in the future. Are they going to be dead? Absolutely dead. There's the cap rates. You can see the highs and lows. You can see that, that wave effect again, as I talked about. There's Richmond, our folk area. Same transactional volume. This is the S&P retail index. You can just see it start, you know, it ends down in the A to downturn and comes back up again. Okay, but we're peaking. We are peaking and we are not creating the jobs. Median incomes are not rising. We're not creating the discretionary income. This is going to be a problem in retail coming forward. And retail construction is fairly flat going forward. And it'll be greening, it'll be consolidation, mixed use. Online retail sales are growing dramatically. Look at that. They keep going from up to almost $400 billion. And if that continues to rise, that means that $400 billion is not being transacted in a store. It is not coming out of that store. And so what happens? Bricks, how bricks and mortar begin to lose if they don't change? Because they can't compete for the pricing. They can compete for convenience. There's too much space that they have to put for category killers. Sensory reaction. You can go down the list. Each one of those things, the high TI investments, Online, there's no TI investments, you know, just a website. So as that begins to change, retail is one that's going through the most transformational part of all in this country. Now, I love retail, but I like grocery anchor retail. Go back to Maslow, go back to my hierarchy of needs. People have to eat, and they will always go to buy food someplace. But that, other kinds of retail, they don't have to go there, and that's the difference. Multifamily is one that has been a home run, an absolute home run in the last several years. 46%, almost 50% of millennials are going to have less kids than their parents. Single person households are increasing dramatically. Household sizes are down. 35% um, of people who previously, who are current renters, previously owned a home. That was through that whole bubble we went through with, with all of the workouts of the single family. And right now, there's about 2.5 million people close to that who are living in home or doing something, but they should be renting. But because there's no jobs, they're living at home. And once that happens, there's an incredible pent-up demand. Look at what happened as we moved to a renter-based society. We've gone up and down. The peak was 69.2% in single family. We're now down to 64%. We have predicted years ago that it's gonna drop into 60 to 62% home ownership rate. Sam Zell came out two months ago Sam Zell, he was a very well-known real estate guy and from Chicago, said it's going to be 59%. We are moving to a European model of home ownership. What did they do? What did Black, was it BlackRock, I think, just came out? They're taking all the homes, the tens of thousands of homes they own across the country, and they're doing a public read on, on how they're going to rent homes. It's going to be just a rental home market. So all this is investment, but it's not, it's a rental-based investment. So people can pick up and move not have to be uh, wedded to a mortgage and to do something different. And right now, more men live at home than women. These crybabies, are, you know, anyway, they're just, they're home. All these young men, they just don't know what to do is so they hang out and just, I don't know, go to the gym every day. But, um, but what happens is they're, we're not working. 
we're not creating that place that creates the demand that allows us to go there. Marriage, median age at marriage is increasing. Median age at first birth is increasing. All this begins to happen. Interesting little statistic in that box there. Then in 1890, which is a little before I was born, but men waited till they were married until 61% of their lifespan was completed. Today, it's 37%. I guess they got a benefit from getting married early. The point of this is, is that as people marry, but they're not having children, as they delay their marriages, that means they're renting more apartments. As they delay children, that means they're not buying homes. If they don't have the jobs, they don't have that income to do that, that means they're going to be renters. Yes, they're going to rent homes. Yes, they're going to rent apartments. But they're going to be far more renter-based than anything else. So if you're looking around and thinking, oh, I'm going to continue the same model that happened in the 1980s or 90s, it is not going to happen. Here's a perfect slide. I took a bunch of, a bunch of markets here, and you can see Richmond I highlighted with, a, with the arrow. This is the percent of population that can afford a medium price home in the year 2017. So Richmond is 61%. But if you look at some of the other places in the bottom of the side, Silicon Valley, 16%. You can see the differences that happen market-wise, segmentation-wise, of where jobs get created, where high incomes are being created, and therefore the demand for housing units and the supply issues come into play. There's the cap rates. You can see that very, very obvious wave that I've talked about here. And then for Richmond. Richmond is fairly flat. You can see the population is going to add about 55,000 folks between 14 and, and 18. Employment's going to grow about 24,000. But in general, it's kind of an organic, slow growth. And it's good. Some markets have reverse. Other markets are more, more dramatic. So you're a steady performer is what I would probably call that. You take a look at the vacancies from office, and, and again, there's many sources from CBRE and JLL and Cushman and, and RCG and others that I've used to get this, but you can just see here that it's improving in some of those areas, but it's not making dramatic shifts. In some markets, like San Francisco, where you get occupancies in apartments that are like 1%, 2%. You know, it's just it's impossible to find places there. So you're going to be a steady performer, which means you really have to be careful on your business plan, your business model, and how you're going to deploy your resources. So I'm going to end my, my presentation on some predictions. These are predictions that are going to make you think. They're going to make you understand and, and say, wait a minute, is this really going to happen? And this, look at some of these. I believe that the core workforce is going to shrink by 20 or 30% because of robotics. We're going to see robotics take over from fast food ordering to everything from check-in to hotels. Things are going to be done through technology and robotics. So we're going to have more people that are not working. But it also means that where that demand is going to come from real estate. I think office buildings will shift to a 24-7 mindset. It will offer a lot more to use in that particular thing. I think telecommuting, clearly people are going to work more from home, more from their apartments. They're going to use technology differently. The, the, Office spaces is a place to connect. It's not a place to go, always go to. It's a place to have a meeting, but not to say hang out. And so as that begins to change, well, here, I think that future leasing decisions, when you rent space, it's not going to be the CEO or the CFO necessarily. It's going to be the director of human resources. We're seeing that across the country today, where HR directors are making these decisions. Why? Because their corporations and companies are driving them to say, higher workplace productivity, put more people in smaller space, make things more efficient. And so the metrics that HR directors are being driven on is going to drive their abilities and their capacities to start making real estate decisions going forward. I think office space leases are going to become much, much shorter. One, two, three leases, two years at the most. I think they have a lot more space. They want a lot more flexibility, a lot more ability to move. They're not going to take those long-term uh, leases anymore. And I think you'll see lease auctions. Like you can buy buildings online, you can have leases. Okay, here's space. Let's take a bid. Who wants to bid on this lease? Who wants to bid on that lease? You'll have a different way of looking at how we lease buildings. So if you're a broker, you're toast. No. Um, but technology will change the way this thing happens. I think you'll see green conversions. Do not be surprised to see the federal government mandate that any asset that is sold must be converted to a government, U.S. government sanctioned or defined green building. And you must escrow monies in order for that. This is already in conversation back there, okay? 
And so what is going on here is that you're going to add to the cost of that asset because you will be required to do a greening exercise. Remember, 70% of the consumption of energy in this country is, goes through commercial buildings. And so we are going to become the energy czar for America, mandated by federal and state and local taxes. There's San Francisco and Berkeley and, and Oregon, you go down the list, these places tax you for energy and efficiency. They tax you on how much, space, how much energy you use if you don't hit the standard. It's very much driven by this capacity of making you a more green, green deal. I think grocery stores are changing dramatically. They're going to become like America's hangout. You know, you're going to be able to get health care there. You're going to get insurance there. You're going to be able to buy food. You're going to have demonstrations. You're going to have education. You're going to have government services. You're going to have so many things. That, the, the grocery industry is changing so much, and it is absolutely going to be a real hub. It's a cornerstone to retail assets. It will be a place where America goes to get many, many things done. And that's changing dramatically. You look at all the big chains across the country, they clearly are all doing that. But to scare even more, by 2030, uh, and I was at a presentation, this, so I'm sharing part of it here, where Amazon, Amazon has said they are going to be the number one grocer in America by 2030. The number one grocer. That means that we don't leave those boxes anymore necessarily. We need warehouses and distribution channels and ways in which we can move those goods across there. Amazon is going to be it. They're going to compete against Walmart. They're going to compete against that and say we can do it more efficiently, more effectively for the millennials and others who don't necessarily store all their food at one time. I think you'll see um, lease portability, where you lease a building here, and this is where the national firms win out big time. You lease an apartment, lease a space. I can take that, that lease from that apartment in Washington, D.C. or Richmond. I can go over to Chicago. I can transfer the portability of my lease. I can move all around the country and not have to keep resigning leases. I think you'll see office space and even more industrial space being done on units of consumption. You will see big tenants buying units. Microsoft or someone said, I want to buy 10 million units of rent from a national landlord. And I will use those rental chips, the units of consumption, as I need them, when I need them. It will be a new currency, not just leasing it by square footage, but leasing it by units of consumption. I think you'll see 35% of most apartments identify with a charity. Millennials love charities. They love hug the trees, hug the whales, hug everybody, kumbaya, we are the world, right? They're like Sesame Street all over again. And so multifamily is going to be much more charity driven and we donate to the community. This will change. And this transformation makes things very differently. We will need $1.5 trillion of new multifamily properties by 2030. I envision that hospitality firms are going to acquire multifamily companies. I think you will see Marriott and Hyatt and Hilton maybe acquire an Avalon Bay or someone like that. Because the multiple that they can get when you rent an apartment, by the way, I'm getting Marriott reward coupons. Oh, by the way, I can buy into Marriott destination points. Oh, by the way, I can move around the country. Oh, by the way, we have the same training. Oh, by the way, I can buy better benefits. This is going to happen. Multifamily is moving toward hospitality. And you will see the hospitality companies much stronger, much bigger, will be acquiring multifamily companies. I think there's going to be um, a clearly prefab construction. Several people we work with around the country and work with Swiss, Swedish firms and other people that are doing this, um, that they will be able to build multifamily and retail space, they say, 30% quicker and 30% more efficient. No more wasted nails, no more wasted wood, no more wasted anything. It's just prefab, put it up there and go. And it would be a lot more modular ways on which people begin to look at that. I think you're also going to see the certified underwriter. I think because of the securitization of real estate and people's problems with securitization of real estate in the past, is they're going to see a requirement to have loans and notes certified by a certified underwriter. I think you'll see CPA firms and law firms move into this area because it will give you a sense of comfort that we will not have the collapse of the past because we have everybody underwriting everything under all different assumptions. So it'll be, a, it'll be in essence, a good housekeeping seal of approval of how this begins to happen when you underwrite and securitize notes, you sell assets, and things of that nature. I think there's going to be a huge shortage, huge shortage of real estate people. Who's under the age of 30 in the room? Just raise your hand. Anybody under the age of 30? Like 10 of you. That's too bad. That's the future. That's the future. 
because all these old folks, all these boomers are going to retire and be getting out. And once they solidified it, they do not want to go through another cycle downturn. They want to you know, monetize their chips, put, take some money off the table. They want to be able not to take the same risk. They do not want to take risk at 70, 75, 80 years of age. And they're going to retire, retire in mass. But we've not done a good job of recruiting young people, and we're going to have a shortage of good talent. There's a lot of folks out there, but we have a shortage of good talent, and that's going to be a real problem for our industry. 60% of CEOs are going to be gone by 2020. 45% of CFOs will be gone. These are just surveys we do nationally, and they're all there. They're not going to be around 7, 8, 9, 10 years from now. They're going to be gone. A new CEO, a new CFO, new leaders, new people, bringing in new technologies, new visions, new transformations. But if you don't prepare today, you're going to hit the wall when it happens in 2020. I think you'll see half, or not half, 15% of universities will be gone. I think a lot of this is moving to the online system. And as you look at training today, you look at education today, you see what Stanford and, and, and University of Pennsylvania and Harvard and Yale and so many others are offering degrees and programs online. You do not have to go to the university. That will continue to transfer that. And those universities will become corporate centers for research, particularly in STEM and cancer and technologies and data management and, 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 and you know, high tech and all that kind of stuff. That's where the, the places are. I would go right to the University of Richmond. I mean, I'd hang out over there because if, if, they do, if they do it right, they could be an incredible opportunity that goes on over there. I think you're going to see as many as 35% of the grocery stores gone. That's going to be changed. Why? Because people are going to be buying online. They're going to have the Amazons. They're going to have other places that they're going to do. And the distribution centers and drones and other things are going to deliver product. It already is there. They've been advertising that they can now deliver... I forget who did I, I, I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of the company. But they're going to be deliveries that can deliver to you in your car when you're moving, in essence. Wherever your car is will deliver to where you are. It's not even at your home. Where are you going to be will deliver where your car is. And so this changes. Online retail sales are going to make many of these centers obsolete. They can't compete. They can't compete. And so what do we have to do with those things? They're going to be redeveloping a mixed-use project. It can be residential, entertainment, government services. They're going to be really places where people can gather. And there's great places like that all over the country that are incredibly exciting, dynamic retail spaces being created in industrial warehouses and industrial areas that are absolutely dynamic. And you should just see some of those. They're great. I think we're going to see all the titles we have, a lot of the titles in real estate gone. We have director of property management. We don't manage properties. We manage a business. We have, in, remember, it's inside the four walls that counts, not just the four walls. People have to be really much more effective. We'll upgrade the quality of our people when we start talking to them as business leaders, enterprise leaders. They're running a massive multi-million dollar asset. And depending on the size, it could be millions of dollars of rent over periods of time. Why do we call them a property manager? We should create an upgrade. That's how we attract better talent. That's how we'll be more successful. I think you're going to see a lot more programmatic elements. Much of that. Some of our retail clients have gone that direction. They're making millions and millions of dollars. And this is what you're going to start seeing. Sponsorships, car shows, book shows, demonstration kitchens, movies, um, you name it. It will be at those retail centers. It will become a place you want to go all the time because it's so dynamic. I think you're going to see, uh, clearly as you come forward here, the ocean. The ocean is an untapped resource. And the next 10 or 15 years or so from now, we're going to see the ocean being someplace where people are going to look at, how can I build new islands, new office buildings, new places to live? It will be a place of, of incredible aquatic growth for, for food products and things of that nature. We're going to see the CBREs and others of the world beginning to lease that space, change the dynamic, how this begins to work. This is already being, you, you know what, uh, what they're doing in Abu Dhabi and other places, how they're creating this space. All I'm trying to do is open your eyes to these incredible things that are about to happen here. I think you're going to see tenant, um, uh, um, tenant secured satellites because people have a, have a problem. I think some of the bigger firms that have big platforms will be able to offer much higher technology efficiencies. So we'll see more, again, that technology in that satellite. I think you're going to see 66 million square feet, new square feet of, of self-storage. I mean, all of this is going to happen. And as this begins to change, the future has indeed arrived today. 
And everything that you look about from the psychology of real estate, the real estate cycle, the demands for asset classes, the shifts in demographics, the way in which we're viewing real estate, it means that we have to change if we're going to be successful in the future. Thank you very much. I'm overwhelmed. I think when the uh, 2018 hits, I'm going to stay at home. <laughs> um, unbelievable predictions. The one that really stuck with me was uh, privatizing the ocean. I kept thinking about Galen lending on privatizing the ocean. Um, thank you very much for being here. I'd like to introduce uh, our panelists. This is going to be a conversation, give and take. Uh, this is really about uh, predicting the future with respect to Richmond uh, and where we agree or disagree, uh, both uh, really from a macro perspective to a, uh, a micro perspective. I asked Chris what you do. He said, Sydney, I'm really not an economist. I'm a futurist. I want people to discuss what they're thinking. He's challenging us to think. I have a lot of experience here. My wife, all the time, says to me, Sydney, what were you thinking? Now, um, <laughs> my answer for that is, honey, you don't understand. Uh -huh. And a lot of these problems are going to become opportunities. So I'd like to introduce uh, Galen Layfield with uh, Zenith Bank, um, Chuck Wall with uh, Troutman, Vince Nader with uh, Kiter, Brad Sauer, who I've known a long time, he's a developer, Ryan Lingerfeld, uh, developer, investor, and uh, Chris, feel free to uh, jump in. Uh, before we get started on the questions, I, kept, I saw this program the other day, and it's about, it's really picking up what you were saying, the iPhone. It's everything you say wrapped up in this single phone, from mail to scheduling to Google search to getting rid of the landline phones, books, newspapers, education, uh, traffic maps, uh, buying stuff, booking reservations, Expedia, the camera, the video. Uh, as a boomer, this comes difficult for me, but it is absolutely the future. Think about some of the things that are going on in this town. We've got uh, the recently announced uh, Regency Mall. We've got the Manchester area. We've got the Libby Place and the things that you're doing on Broad Street. Uh, of course, Lingerfeld is not only in Richmond, but they're buying around the country. Uh, the Willow Lawn area, uh, the Boulevard. And I also want to talk areas that are having difficulties. So let's kick it off. Who wants to give it a shot? Galen, you want to talk about uh, your view of the world? Well, one thing I would add to your, your conversation about the phone is this is, this is the next bank branch. Okay. Um, and as you think about notwithstanding all the banks have been built on Libby and Patterson, is it, or whatever it is, every bank in the world is, is putting up a, another facility. Um, but as it relates to getting your head wrapped around some of the things that will change, you know, the next, the next great business for all you real estate developers is, is the adaptive reuse of bank branches because they are, there are 80 some odd thousand bank branches in this country um, and although we do see some being built, the likelihood of that continuing is, is zero. I mean, it'll be, it'll be half of that, here's my prediction, it'll be half of that in 20 years. And how about, and how about the loans? I mean, you've got all the student loan overhang uh, overhang debt. How does that yep. affect it? In the, you know, I know we're going to this rental-based thing, but is that affected by the, is that the lifestyle, uh, or is that more of the affordability by the by the millennials? Well, one thing I would say that relates to what what Chris was talking about the millennials, uh, the the student loan debt. I mean, is probably the biggest overhang on that on that cohort of of folks that are coming along. This is 16 to what is it, 34 year olds or something, Chris? I think. Um, largest cohort we've ever had is 10 million more people than the baby boomers. So if you think about the impact that that crowd is going to have as we look at it over the next 25 or 30 years, um, certainly student debt, I think it's 45 percent of them have student debt outstanding and the average amount is $17,000. That's a big number in the aggregate. Um, 
where I might disagree a little bit with Chris on, on the conversation there is while I think it's going to hold them back, um, it, at the end of the day, I think that generation is going to be so powerful and so impactful that it will, they'll, they'll overcome all of that with their educational background and actually, and actually lead us to a new place in terms of growth and expansion that we've probably not experienced in this country before. So they are going to get out of the house. I think they'll work out. They're, they're going to get out of the house. They're also, when they work out of some of those things on a delayed basis, I actually believe they're going to go back in the housing market more strongly than maybe some others would yeah. think. Is the, actually, I want to go to Ryan now. Is the, is the um, you're buying both in the suburbs around the country. You're in several cities. Uh, where do you see this changing in the office? The 24-7. Yeah, we, so we really haven't seen um, like a migration back into the CBD in a lot of our cities. I mean, using Richmond as an example, we've we probably got, I don't know, a couple hundred tenants in our portfolio. We maybe lost two over the last six, seven years to go to the CBD. We've gotten far many uh, more tenants coming out of the CBD. And I, I guess, you know, the question, if you want to stick with the residential for a second, the question I would have is, as those 80 million uh, millennials age and pay off their student debt and, and get a career and, and get married are they really going to want to rent an apartment in the city for the next 30 years and I would predict the answer is no well I see all this growth going out downtown I see all the apartments being built uh, you, you think it's still going to the suburbs I mean I do and uh, the, the data suggests that uh, you, know, if you look across the US as a whole millennials prefer to move out of the city once they age up, get a job, get married, they want the house, they want the yard and the little dog and all that fun Just stuff. What, one comment about that is I think, I think there will be a switch. Um, I think those millennials will come from the CBDs and the towns and places to the suburbs. I think the older boomers will come back into the city. Gotcha. Um, I think they're going to rent their homes out to those, to those folks. The young people want to have a school. They don't want to get the school from the inner mm -hmm. cities. They're going to take the schools in the suburbs. But the old folks, boomers, whatever, are going to want to come in where they can walk around, they get coffee, go to movies, go to entertainment, they can do a whole bunch of things. So there's going to be a little bit of switch going on here. And the thing about the student loan debt, be careful that that's one component. But the other thing is that we have incurred an incredible amount, trillions and trillions of dollars of debt in the last several years. And that debt is going to be paid back with higher taxes and higher ways of, of payment. So what we think we, the boomers, may, uh, the young people may be able to do, we're saddling them with an incredible amount of obligation that they're going to be taking out of their paychecks and everything that they do. And so that's going to hold this consumerism down and some of those components, delay some of that decision for periods of time. Do you see these boomers, you know, the generation before the boomers, um, they're going to these homes like a Cedarfield, which is in Richmond, is a, a, active adult. Uh, other types of, but it's all filled up with old people. Do you see that shift to where they want to be in an urban environment, where they want to be in a nexus of development, where they can get coffee? And uh, the boomers don't want to think they're old. Um, so if they go with, with a bunch of folks that are just, you know, being carted out every day in an ambulance, that's not where they want to hang out. Um, I am not old, <laughs> but I think in five-year terms now. Yeah, um, I, the, I, uh, think, I think what you'll see, though, is that you're already seeing the age-restricted housing and those things. Senior housing is going to be growing. I mean, if you, want to, if you want to invest in senior housing, invest in Alzheimer's centers, dementia care, and those are going to be exploding off the chart as the parents of the boomers go through that period of time right now. But in, in general, I think the boomers are, are going to work longer, stay working longer, either full-time or part-time. I think they're going to not want to go into retirement housing, but they will move back into the city because they want to have the entertainment, the walk-around ability. I love colleges and universities. I think a lot of them will come back to colleges and universities because they can get another degree. They can go watch a football game, watch chess, get a cup of coffee, whatever they want to do. You know, is this you because have we fun. have the Is this because we have the uh, opportunity to do that, or is this an actual lifestyle mindset change with the boomers? I, I, the boomers are not going to have enough money for retirement. The vast majority of people in America do not have enough money to retire. And a significant portion uh, have less than $50,000 of savings. So there is going to be a real need to say, where are people going to be? If their only asset is their house and their only equity is their house, either going to do a reverse mortgage out or they're going to try to rent the doggone thing and sell it and carry the note back or whatever. So they have income to support the meager Social Security checks they might get. So part, part of it is, is financially driven and part of it is lifestyle driven. Now, Ryan, you're thinking it's still going back out to the suburbs, but you're buying 
high-rise buildings and like in Jacksonville. So aren't you contradicting yourself? No, well, so we're opportunist, opportunistic buyers. So we're not looking for you know, the big macro trend of a population move. And we're gonna buy something, we're gonna buy it cheap. It's gonna be half empty when we buy it and then we'll, we'll fill it up. We're not, I mean, we're still seeing demand in the CBD. I just think on a whole, if you're, if you're counting on the millennials to move back into the CBD and rent apartments forever, it's, that's not gonna happen. And I don't think that, that corporations are, you know, looking in the CBD over the, the suburbs in many places. We're just not seeing it. Do you agree with Chris on the, the whole change of the smaller square footage down to 100 square feet, the telecommuting, the virtual office? I do. Yeah, we're certainly seeing that. Downsizing place or, you know, if they're consolidating offices, we're seeing that all over the portfolio. Yeah. What do you, now, Brad, you're developing up in several areas. You're up and down Broad Street. Well, uh, yeah, Sydney, I, I would give a little bit of an uh, uh, alternative view to this, that uh, uh, the uh, concept of live, work, shop, play, and drink is a powerful <laughs> concept. And uh, um, if you can find a site in the metropolitan area, in the city limits, that you can develop mixed use in, you're going to be successful. And one of the reasons is that all the retailers left the city pretty much 100%, like in the 70s. And um, now, now the demographics have switched and the population is growing again. They, they, they are all going to want sites in the city. Now the, the, the um, challenge is finding the sites. So if somebody's patient and wants to assemble some sites in the city, they, they're going to be in a very strong position as far as uh, they're going to have more tenants than they're going to have uh, prospects. But, I want to ask everybody this question. It appears to me that people are going to downtown, but I've had people say to me, Sydney, that's not exactly right. These mixed-use developments, the urban mixed-use zoning, you're actually talking about pedestrian, walkable, friendly areas that could be in the suburbs too. Um, you've got Libby Place that just won this big award. Uh, we're trying to get Libby that. Mill. Huh? Libby Mill. Libby, Libby Mill. Mill. I'm sorry. Libby, Libby Mill. And uh, I insult you right now. Um, Innsbruck's break. trying to do this. Uh, <laughs> you've got other areas. And jump in. What are the projects that you see? And do you agree with that? Um, the issue is more about the nexus of a the city effect, not necessarily in the city. Well, to me, if you're going to have um, people living really dense, uh, it makes more sense in the city. You know, that, that if you've got a cow pasture next to your um, parking deck, people would probably rather be uh, low density. But the, the whole concept of mixed use and dense, it's an urban concept, urban mixed use. Um, uh, the, the idea of building um, uh, West Broad Street Village in Short Pump was a contradiction as far as I'm concerned. You don't think it was maybe not enough or maybe not uh, well, it's not urban. It's, it's not urban. It's urban mixed use is the zoning category, but it's in short pump, which is suburb. Okay. Libby Mill is in an urban location. Well, yeah, and one of the issues is infrastructure, because to me it seems like where they are doing these mixed use, but everything seems to be the greenfield outer development seems to have slowed down, and the interest is whether it's all downtown in the CBD or the or the, the, these intense mixed use area nexus of major roads. Uh, and the question says, how do we fund that infrastructure? And I know you're focused on that. How do we do it? I know um, I spent a lot of time in Henrico County. They're one of the best in the country. They've got a uh, billion dollars of future capital expenditures coming up in the next 10 years. They've got a half a billion dollars in unfunded pensions. They've got huge mandates. They don't have the money and they're the best of the best. I know you're in this area, Chuck. Yeah, that's right. I mean, Henrico is a great example. They're the best of the best, and they've got tremendous needs, like you say. Um, you know, the infrastructure, all the reports relating to the, the bridges and roads and so forth across the country, and in Richmond as well, the deterioration and the need to replace those is going to have a huge impact on where people are going to live and what they're going to be able to tolerate in terms of congestion and, and not being able to get around. Does this talk about also the privatization of existing infrastructure or more about the new? And is it public private or is it uh, more trending towards more private? Well, I think it's trending towards public private. Um, I, I, I don't see a, a big move either now or, or down the road a few years of, of publicly owned roads. 
but or privately owned rather, but the public private partnerships for the big projects, there's definitely a huge appetite for uh, investment capital in those. We're seeing those across the country. Um, the projects up in Northern Virginia, the, the 95 and 495 hot lanes projects. Um, I-66 is ready to come out with a, a P3 project of a similar sort, funded by um, tolls, and that's sort of consistent with what Chris is saying in terms of, you know, renter-based society. It's, it's a user-based society in terms of using those roads and paying for it. Well, you it, know, yes, of just one, one comment. Just, if you have a chance, I mean, some of the cities like Denver, Colorado, has got a thing called Fast Track, and it is the most unbelievable way of stimulating growth through, um, you know, a, a mass transit system that's on a rail. And it's, in, it's creating growth outside of the urban area because of that. And the young people are gravitating because they don't mind riding those vehicles into the city or into the suburbs. Salt Lake City just completed a mass transit system from downtown to the airport. Um, each city that's taken the risk of creating a mass transit facility that is high speed and it's rail based, not buses, has been immensely successful in creating a long term plan. So I don't know what happens here, but to the extent you can create some mass transit infrastructure, it will create development like you would not believe. Richmond, I believe, is unique in the extensive amount of its infrastructure. It's doted on itself being the capital of the state. Um, do you really see the need, or who sees the, the need? Do we really, can we really justify mass transit in Richmond because it's so diffused, there's not the kind of intensity you see on a, on a Tyson's or Arlington? Any comments on that? I think, I mean, the, the light rail concept, which is popping up, and you've got the Purple Line project, which is on deck uh, up in uh, Southern Maryland, just outside the district, um, other projects like that, where you've got the density that will uh, support that type of uh, growth. In Richmond, I don't, because of the reason you explained, Sydney, I, I don't see us headed towards that anytime soon. How about the privatization of government assets? Do you see that? Do you get in that area also? I do, um, and I think that's going to come slower. Uh, one of the things probably that we will be seeing is something that we call social infrastructure, and that touches on courthouses and prisons and that sort of thing. There's projects coming up. There's a Long Beach uh, project uh, for a courthouse. Miami-Dade is, is looking at that, a similar thing, and, and we're seeing more and what's more. What's going to happen with 460? Well, uh, that was a whole boondoggle. Yeah, I think it's already happened. Uh, to a degree um, with the administration uh, canceling the contract. Um, that's a, an unfortunate uh, circumstance, certainly, uh, that's going to have to be resolved in some way. Uh, the idea, obviously, is an economic development tool is a good one. The tolls wouldn't support it, and so the Commonwealth changed the, the model of the project sort of midstream, and that made it a little bit of a different sort of P3 than was anticipated. I, I lived up until a year and a half ago. I lived in Bethesda for six years, and I love that 495. It changed my life. And you're gambling, because the rate varied from $2 to $10, depending on the level of traffic, and you're gaming the system, which has a whole other fun aspect to it. Uh, <laughs> one of the things uh, uh, that Chris was talking about is this change of the standard living, of affordability. Vince, yes, sir. we've got, I think, taxes are going up. I think the percentage of the whole thing and the regulatory, personally, to me, the regulatory uh, impacts that we're having uh, in getting permission, uh, and I put that in the area of compliance. What are you, how do you feel about this? Well, you're right, taxes are going up. Yesterday was, uh, I don't know if you follow pop culture or not, but yesterday was Tax Freedom Day in Virginia, which means now you're working for yourself. It took until April 27th for us to work long enough to pay all of our payroll tax, income tax, everything else in the last year. Uh, so the federal tax freedom day was April 24th for the average. That was three days longer than last year, and last year was three days longer than the previous year, and we're, we're getting pretty close to, to May. So tax rates are going up. I think the regulations are going up. And if this administration stays in control, I think you're going to see, I think one of, one of the administration's uh, top five initiatives is, is the Buffett rule and making sure people pay X bottom line, which I think is like 30%. The, the cure yeah. everybody keeps saying is 
tax the successful, tax the rich. There's plenty to go around. Have you see people's statements. Is that really true? It's well, it's happening. I don't, I don't know if it How fixes more, any problems, but it's but is, definitely happening. Does it affect the incentive to produce? I mean, at some point, you say, why, sure. why do I take the risk when the upside is taxed and the downside, I got to eat the whole thing? We hear them say, why would I be doing this? Is it really worth it? Am I earning enough? And but, but, but the folks that are earning a mountain, paying the taxes, are driven enough that they that they continue to to do these projects and and continue to build their wealth and. I think it's just uh, the price that they pay. So, I mean, yeah, they're, they're still doing it, but they're questioning why is it worth it. And so uh, looking at it before they jump into a project that might put them into a different level, I think, is something they're going to be doing. I think, I think as a combination to that whole side of the equation on the tax side is also interest rate. You know, we are going through this low period of interest rate, and it, they are going to be rising over the next two or three years for sure. Just think what happens if they rise 100, 200 basis points, what that does to real estate. So when you talk about where things might be, higher taxes, higher interest rate, high federal debt, in longer times of entitlement and regulation, that's the concerns that we have. That's why you've got to change your models today and begin to really take advantage of these things. Otherwise, they're going to hit you like a brick in four or five years. Uh, and Chris had mentioned the, the mandates of all the green, and um, I don't... I don't know that they'll necessarily be mandates, but I, su I suspect that, as always, the, the regulations will try to ins provide incentives to go green or maybe even um, how it's been the last few years, disincentives to not be green. And so it might be um, something similar to a mandate to builders and developers that you know, you've got to be much more e energy efficient, et cetera. In addition to incentives, how about the hammer being beat on our knees uh, as far as the VSMP, you know, environmental phosphorus, nitrogen, wetlands, all these things. It's, to me, this is the hidden tax on the mind. Does anybody have any comments on this? Is it, do you think it's true? I mean, do you find environmental issues uh, getting permission, not just the incentive to do it, but the whole issue of compliance? Do you have a problem? Yeah, you're, so you're buying existing. Sure, it makes, makes, certainly makes the development of greenfield sites a little bit more difficult. Maybe it takes um, you know, more land to build the same size building than it used to five, ten years ago. You know, that we would just price that into the job, though. And so uh, you know, I guess the, you know, the end result would be a lower land value if, if you know what you're, you're dealing with. Is it? What? Well, yeah. one, th one thing is the issue may not be about the building. It's going to be about corporations trying to recruit young talent. Young people today want to and prefer to be working in environments that they perceive to be green or perceive to be sustainable or perceive to have some community benefit. And that's why corporations are taking and leasing space that are in LEED certified buildings, um, you know, any kind of Energy Star buildings, things of that nature, where they can attract young people who are more sensitive to that than the older folks that are out there today. And that's why this wave of green will happen and major corporations are absolutely committed to having their buildings green to attract that young person. Let, let's talk about some specific deals in Richmond. The last one that we read about in the paper, and everybody I'm talking to has an idea. Everybody's an expert in real estate just like they are when you go into a restaurant. You think you can do a better job than the restaurant operator. Everybody's talking about what they want to do with Regency Mall. Of course, it's really up to the developers. But where do you think that's going? Is that going to commentary? Nothing? I think it'd be a great college site. Yeah. I mean, I great what? A college site, some sort of community college community or something. Community college? Like that. I've heard uh, housing, places for the boomers to retire so they don't have to leave Henrico County, walkable, more entertainment, more food. Uh, it could be anything. I think the there's a lot, a lot of boomers who, who live in that area who are you know, headed towards retirement that would very much like to stay in that area. And so I think there's a certainly an attractiveness for residential. The developer says it's going to stay retail. Well, Most, yeah. I could see since they bought the mall and they didn't buy yet Sears and uh, what's the other one? You got um, Penny's, Penny's and, and uh, a department store. No. I'm guessing they think they can wait that out in, uh, yeah. in the direction. That's the retail that's really under huge, huge stress. Uh, what's going to happen? You know, West Broad Street is just the 
it's very little mixed use. It's mainly just more of the standard retail, but it's running out of utilities and it bumps into West Creek. How's that area going to turn out? Where do you see that? Is that going to become a, uh, an urban nexus point? How's, how's that play? Need to have an interchange with uh, Gaten Road, and that's the infrastructure question. Because right now the traffic is a mess. And that interferes? Yeah. You Not a developer. Yeah. You're not a <laughs> <laughs> You are not a developer, but you are certainly into their books. Uh, you may know you actually, Vince, may know more about what's going on than any one of us other than other than Galen. Um, well, where are the other areas that you see that have uh, you got the Manchester? Uh, in Innsbruck, Dixon Hughes, the CPA firm, just uh, just stated they're leaving. And so I asked one of the partners, I said, how come you leave in Innsbruck? We love having you out there. And they said, here's the deal. The deal is the young people in our organization want to be downtown. They want to be where the action is. Do you all agree with that? I do. I know Ryan thinks it's limited, but that is a phenomenon. Yeah, we, we, we see it. And, and I can I mean, there, there are a handful of others that are, have I've heard exactly the same thing from who are in the suburbs coming back downtown, I mean, it just sort of strikes me that when you listen to the conversation, it, it's sort of not either or, it's, it is, but it is in some ways a, uh, a change in what cohort of, of folks are going to be downtown versus suburbs um, from what we've seen historically. So while you've got um, young kids today moving downtown in the Central Business District, the millennials, at some point they're going to go they're going to go to the suburbs, and conversely, Chris is suggesting that the boomers are going to come back downtown um, in, in some consequential way. So it's like a so it's, house swapping. Well, sort of. But re remember, when you, when you do redevelopment, you need themes. You know, the arts district, the entertainment district, the innovation center. You've got, it's not just building a building. It, it's creating a destination and a place that people want to go will create the opportunities for development. So buildings for building's sake make no sense to me. Buildings that are based around a theme or are based around a concept have a lot more chance of survival and success. So I don't know where the downtown is, but as you, as you look at that, it seems to me there are districts or areas that could be where, where, it's, where it's pedestrian oriented. Where you could make it the arts district or the innovation center or the this and that and attract people who want to be part of that space uh, for housing and entertainment and whatever they might do, so it's it's theming your developments and concepting them in that concept in that way versus just building a building. I'd like to follow up on a perspective of that that I'm running into um, lately, and actually I'm working with Ryan on, and that is um, I'll give you an example. Uh, in Chesterfield County, they have been extraordinarily competitive on. Um, their Meadowville project and others, they've gotten Amazon, Capital One, the uh, Chinese firm, what's it called? Um, Traylon, uh, it's yeah. the paper, yeah, it the, hadn't the paper. closed yet, but this huge jobs creator. Think about this, Henrico County, very nonchalantly said in the paper a month ago, oh by the way, we just gave up the uh, tools and machinery tax. By, we just reduced it by 70%. We're going to give up $1.3 million a year in tax revenue for the chance of being more competitive. Because right now, they're not on the radar screen like Chesterfield is. Chesterfield has been more competitive. Are we going to be, and if that's a, and then downtown, you got Stone Brewery, and they've, $23 million. As developers, as business people, are you seeing more competition between the localities, the incentives they do? Are they, in, in essence, they have the same problem. We have trying to be more competitive. Comments? Well, I, I see a lot of competitiveness on that. Um, and not just in Richmond, but other localities. You've got the regional um, economic development authorities, you know, down in, for example, the, the Gateway region uh, down in the Petersburg and Hopewell Colonial Heights area competing for uh, you know, similar things and, and working with uh, it incentives to do the exact same thing that you're talking about. So I don't think it's just a, a Henrico issue. There's a, there's a lot of fierce competition out there for that. And, and, and in that same context, 
I'm seeing uh, this whole issue of, uh, is that, I hate to pick on Henrico, but I will. Uh, they're regular, they have regulations that even when you ask them, why do you have these regulations? They can't tell you, as I tell them, you've won. You have control of everything. I have to get permission for everything. But it slows up the process. <clears throat> and so does anybody else have commentary on jockeying around? I, you know, Ryan and I have seen that. Yeah, sure. I, I think it's maybe even less about what incentives are given and more about just being pro-growth in general I and mean, just getting out of the way or helping facilitate just a simple site plan approval. I mean, getting something done in Goochland County versus in Riker County, it's, it's kind of night and day. And then Goochland County wants development. They want people to come out. You know, we're building in, in West Creek now uh, with the Pruitts, and, and they want people. They want buildings. They're they want apartments. They want, and, and, and in Riker, just, just, you're going to run their process. It's going to take you 120 days, and they're going to stand in your way. And if everything's not ticked and tied, you're not getting your approval. But they, in their whole finances, they've made it clear they have to have growth to sustain the budget they're projecting without changing their, I think it's what, 86, 87 cents per, per square foot. How's the, how's the city to work with? Uh, the, the city is very flexible. Yes, the, 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 <laughs> I, I, would, I would put the city. I don't, I don't know what that means. Uh, <laughs> you're, you know, I will tell you what somebody told me. They said, Sydney, the city of Richmond is very successful in spite of themselves. Um, that's maybe less tactful. Any other comments? Do you see the, the relationship between how uh, Chesterfield versus Goochland, which I hear they have gotten extremely competitive, and going after deals in the other counties? Uh, comments on this? Well, you know, um, with industrial, you've got uh, White Oak uh, Industrial Park, which is owned by the state, but in Henrico. And so economic development brings you a deal, but you're competing, the people that bring you the deal are actually your competitors. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's happened to me um, more than once. How do you feel about that? <laughs> well, it's... Uh, uh, Tell me what you really think now, Brad. Yeah, yeah they, 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 uh, uh, they're, they're all in it for the jobs, you know. And so, uh, so they, they look at it as like whether they go in in White, White Oak or whether they go into a, a private developer's uh, industrial park. It's all good because they came to the region. Yeah, but it, but affect, it affects you. You have yeah. less business. Uh, I've heard the restaurants there are up. A lot of these restaurants, these breweries, are upset about this stone brewing deal. I mean, it's great for jobs, yeah. but some of these people think it's very unfair. What, what do you guys think? You, you represent people who are, are, they are, they are the people that are affected by those types of uh, subsidies from our localities. There's definitely folks that were here in town already and had worked to establish themselves and then you know, it seems like a a fairly large deal for someone coming into the city, but um, that's part of the, I'm sure what the city is trying to do is bring in new stuff, so. <laughs> that, that's, you know, they're trying to bring in all. stuff, but the deal is they're using our money. I mean, do you, how do you feel about this? You think it's fair? What do you, well, Chris, what do you see around this? I, I, I'm going to say it's less about the buildings, it's more about the jobs. Um, a community is going to survive based upon its jobs, based upon its environment. And if there's not effective leadership that creates jobs, creates that opportunity, I don't care what buildings you're going to put. Um, so to me, it's a combination. Buildings fulfill a need that's been created by a job. Uh, and, and so the attractability of a job results in a, in a demand for real estate. It, it's a basic, simple thing. Well, I'm going to tell you something. I'd love to get some of that free money. Um, So, where are the jobs growth? Do you see the jobs, uh, Ryan, growing here in Richmond? Yeah, we've seen a fair amount of organic growth in all of our tenants. You know, we got, got through the recession, you know, a little bit of downsizing, but now they're all hiring again and, and growing. Let me ask you another question about um, this UMU. I'm, I'm going to use Innsbruck as an example because at 5 o'clock, 25,000, 20, 25,000 people leave. There are 25,000 parking spaces. They go to Short Pump Mall. Town center, 25,000 more parking spaces. They go there for a couple hours, buy stuff, go to the grocery store. Then they drive home to their house with another 25,000 driveway spaces. So we have 75,000 parking spaces for 25,000 people. One of the things with the UMU that's been discussed is if you infill in a portion with the residential and the recreational, you can start to much more efficiently use that infrastructure. If who's doing it? I know you're doing analysis on it. Who else is? 
playing with those numbers and how much is it in the, in the whole parking lot ratio and other efficiencies on infrastructure. Go for it. Well, that's where mass transit ultimately will, uh, uh, and the city does have a project now. It's called the uh, bus rat rapid transit line. It's going to go from Rockets Landing to Willow Lawn, and it's funded. It'll open in uh, 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 2017, the middle of the year, and uh, it's a uh, it, it cuts. Uh, uh, you you can't drive in a car or or take the current bus system, and you'll get there at half the time with this new system, and it's a. Uh, um, do you see it? I mean, is it actually working? I know out in, uh, in Gaskins and uh, 64, this is huge, uh, what do you call it, the reverse commute bus? Park and ride. Park and ride. When I go by there, they're not, it's not, it's, mostly, it's more empty than filled. I don't know, are you seeing the same? I, I just don't believe it's being used as it theoretically was projected and maybe that's because we have a lot of roads any any comments on that yeah our, our mass transit system is is in its infancy but if, if, if this BRT works from rockets landing to uh, um, will Lawn, the, the the next idea is that it'll go down Broad Street ultimately to short pump in, in essence we might need more density to pull it off one of the things we're seeing in this densification analysis we don't have enough infrastructure, uh, water, sewer, the whole thing. Uh, how do we deal with that? And, and, and a lot of it is obsolete. We're just seeing huge numbers. So in order to create these mixed-use developments, which creates the, the demand for the mass transit, how do we get, what do we do with these utilities? It's huge numbers. Yeah, I, I think you touched on it in terms of the obsolete uh, aspects of the you know the water and sewer systems and the other utilities um, because you you need those to to have the inner city development I mean I th one of the things that Chris touched on was the, the prefabrication and the construction costs going down I think that really is going to uh, help with with the development inner city but huge problems with that infrastructure and again I think private investment is going to have to play a part in that in order to move it forward because the money's just not otherwise there. How do we finance all this? I know, and again, in some of the localities I talk to, obviously, a lot of them have used up a big percentage of their debt capacity. Right. Well, I don't know if there's any easy answer to that question, Sydney. I mean, it's a, it's a myriad of resources, and the, and the banks certainly will play some role, although, you know, banks are fundamentally senior debt lenders. Um, they're not, they're not really speculative lenders. Um, some of this falls in the category of it's got to be, there's got to be equity, there's got to be public funding associated with it, and then there's the public debt markets. I mean, it's going to be some combination of all of those things. The, I, what I, I mean, I would just make an observation on the private side. I mean, everything we see would, would point to there's a lot of capital um, that, is, that has for a long time been sitting on the sidelines. I mean, I think the capital is there for the right for the right projects under the right circumstances. Um, are you getting looser in your lending? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not sure as I would characterize it as loose. Um, however, um, it is clearly a, uh, a borrower's market. Um, there are, uh, back to, I mean, there's just, there's, there's plenty of capital. There, the economy, the economic growth, the recovery we've had has been relatively slow. Um, there are too many banks, um, and so everybody is falling all over themselves to see if they can't get the next transaction. What we have seen for the most part thus far is, is very competitive pricing and, and a fair amount of reasonableness around the underwriting criteria. But you just give us enough time, and we'll let that go, to, go that way as well. <laughs> we always do, Vince, as an industry. Comment on this, Vincent. How much is... Uh, ties back the tax credits and the whole thing of depreciation yeah. schedules, which I know are getting more difficult. How does that? Well, it can't be all private money. I mean, if you look at a lot of stuff that's happened in the last 10 years with a lot of the uh, historic rehabs, nobody was going to do those rehabs if they were going to fund it all themselves. So all these credits that become available help finance it so that it makes it an affordable project. I think that's probably what's going to have to happen with some of these infrastructure issues and other infill things that need to happen it's not going to be all nobody none of these guys in here are going to go in and 
and just do a project in a place that may not be able to fund it fully themselves. They're going to have to be some sort of incentives, whether it's green or rehab or enterprise zone or something like that that um, helps them fund the infrastructure. How much of the, uh, what I see, a very active development like in Manchester, how much is actually driven by the tax credits? And if they didn't have those tax credits, uh, would those deals get done? Mm, probably not. Mm -hmm. Not did that. Not did that adaptive reuse. I don't think so. I mean, there's some it great. Is a, it is a big number that they're they're getting out of the credits that helps fund it, and it probably would not have happened without those credits. And and banks will underwrite in a way that takes into account the value of those tax credits. How about the public money to do all this? You're, I mean, we're talking about private capital. You now, Brian. You are. You have a lot of institutional capital. <coughs> um, is that correct? That's correct, yeah. <coughs> Where is that money going? Well, what does it mean? I mean, the majority of our partners are large private equity real estate firms. And so they're, you know, opportunistic or value add type investors and they invest alongside us in projects that are, you, know, you buy them cheap and you, you fix them up and fill them up and, and you sell them three to five years later and make a return. That it's not tax credit driven or infrastructure driven. Strictly uh, just yield driven. Buy low, so high. Do they are they have a time period they want to hold on to it, or is it trying to turn the product quicker? I mean, you're talking about shorter leases. If he's correct, I mean that changes everything. They're they're bidding out the spaces. They're turning them over quickly. Yeah, I mean, we're three to five year kind of time horizon. There's a business plan associated with with every investment. Once the business plan's been executed, you you exit the investment. What kind of occupancies are you dealing with? We try to buy things that are 30, 40, 50% empty and fill them up to, to whatever the, the submarket occupancy is, typically 85, 90, 95%, and turn around and sell it. You know, Chris, you were talking about the end of retail, but yet on your chart, the lowest vacancy was retail at 7.1%. <laughs> That's right. That means you haven't built a lot of retail. <laughs> so that's it, 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 listen, the. Again, taking the hundreds of billions of dollars that go on the internet sales, and yet that's not even counting catalog sales and all the rest of the things that go on there. There is a clear movement away from retail shop, retail patterns of shopping are changing dramatically. And as a result of that, whether it's the commute time, the parking time, the accessibility, the way to shop 15 stores at one click of a mouse, um, that changes the dynamic. And uh, we are over retailed in so you're general. So it's, it's, it's starting up. Back to this question of uh, where people shop, and then you also talk about where people are living. Part of the phenomenon I keep hearing is we have now 100 craft breweries in Richmond. We've the got. State. No, it's the state. State. <laughs> Not in Richmond. Yeah. I'm drinking too much. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we've got think that's too some great <laughs> restaurants. I understand we're on the map with respect to restaurants, uh, restaurant people who become. Uh, these nationally known restaurant operators. Um, you're seeing this farm to table movement where it's nutritional, where they want, they want a story. It seems like to me this RVA thing, people want a story to identify it's with the millennials. Is that here to stay? You think, I'm not sure where you're coming from, Ryan. This is a general question for everybody. What? Is it real? Is it, is it going to stay or the millennials just, just I think another it's passing trip? No, I think it's real. There are too many of them. Um, 85 million, 38% of the workforce, of the working uh, age people. Um, and it's, and to Chris's points, I mean, it's what, you know, they're driven around a lot of environmental issues and, and the, you know, the farm to table and all of those things. It, I think it's absolutely here to stay. The baby boomers changed the culture when they came along, and so this is just... Baby. It's just the next... Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> are you all in agreement on where you think things are going locally? I, mean, I think we're I mean, over-retailed you're, you're both friends, but you're also competitors. I think we're over-retailed in Richmond. No, over-retailed? Yeah, certainly. I hear that the restaurant seats per capita is just... We're one of the highest in the country. You're not in retail. You're in retail. What do you say? Well, uh, it's all about location, as always. Uh, if, if you've got a, uh, a site, like I was saying, in, in the city of Richmond right now, like uh, uh, 
uh, you, know, you know, we uh, just signed a lease with Whole Foods uh, uh, within the last year, and uh, they had very few options, really. Uh, and, and their quality uh, retail uh, operation. Well, that area's coming back. Uh, you know, you've got the whole Willow Lawn area. What's, again, let me ask you this. You see the areas that are taking off. Where are the areas that you see are next and are ripe for mixed-use development? The city of Richmond. The city of Richmond. How about in the suburbs? What are you lending on? What do you see? You know, you hear things in advance. Well, I don't know how much we hear them in advance, um, but we're certainly lending in all of those markets um, from a, from a uh, multifamily standpoint. I mean, the central business district has been un incredible over the last five years, um, but there's activity. I mean, we were blessed. I mean, in, in Richmond and around the surrounding area, there's a lot of activity in pretty much all of the markets. Um, it's, there's, there's good demand. Um. I'd be curious what the audience uh, has to say about this. Uh, are y'all uh, going along with everything they say? Are they right? I see Lowndes Wilson out there. He's, he's got to be disagreeing with something. Uh, um, I'm disagreeing with the vacancy rate. What do you think? Well, let's do Q&A. Let's get the microphones over here. And I really like to uh, give these guys a hard time. Chris, you said that. Uh, say, your, say your name was Lowndes Wilson. I'm Lowndes Wilson. I'm in the multifamily business. And uh, you said that the vacancy rate in Rich, well, your slide said 12%. But we're seeing it being more like 5%. Yeah. Out, out of 2,200 units, say. It, this is some of those are the forecasts that is in a, a broader regional area, and that was done by uh, real. Or, um, RCG Rosen Group, uh, Rosen Capital Group. So I'm just I was sharing their numbers. I'm not oh. opining on that. What do you, What are you seeing on your properties? You said it was five percent overall. Yeah, that's consistent. Some of them. I mean, there's a Dixon Wallace is here someplace. I think who who works with me and he would know for sure. But I think that's very consistent with what we're seeing. So we're not overbuilding yet. It's not still. Is the percentage of homeowners by going still continue to go down? I don't think so. You don't. No. I mean, um, just just again, this is anecdotal. I mean, I, I mean, if you look at if you look at housing starts in Richmond, they're they're down a little bit here in the last in the last quarter, but there, there's an upward trend, um, and we are absolutely seeing more residential de uh, development building activity than we've seen. Yeah, over I, the last what I was, I, what I meant was the percentage of apartments to. Uh, housing but you're seeing overall housing think, growth still yeah I think that's stabilized Dan do you agree with that where how do you see your housing uh, growth going with respect we get a microphone over here with respect to uh, apartments versus because I believe you're in multifamily and single family that's right we are um, we are um, we're building apartments at a rate as fast as we've ever built them. Um, that's for sure. But the, uh, I mean, I think nationwide, I mean, Chris can probably speak to this better than I could, but I think nationwide uh, apartments are, um, from a percentage basis, are, you know, are keeping up with the um, pace of residential development. And I think, you know, in our portfolio, we are, we are, uh, each year we're building more apartments than we are single family. So, uh, yeah, I agree with what Chris said earlier. I mean, we believe that uh, we are becoming a rental-based society. Uh, uh, we call them renters by choice. And, um, you know, we are, we are developing far more upscale communities, resort-type pools, and that type of thing. And so, you know, so we're getting them and we're keeping them for, uh, we've got renters now that have been with us for 15, 20 years. And, uh, and they have no intention of leaving. 
and uh, yeah, I think we're going to we're going to continue to see that more and more. Is the square footage of these units getting bigger, bigger for apartments or getting smaller? Uh, getting a little smaller. Getting a little smaller. Any other questions? Uh, a lot of people in the brokerage business. Uh, how do they see? Do they agree with the, what they're seeing actually in the field? Yeah, um, just kind of a quick comment. Um, I'm, I'm Bobby Popwitz. I'm with Fluvanna County, the Economic Development Director there. Um, the, the trends we're seeing in our area uh, with UVA, and of course we've put together an actual portfolio for our Zion Crossroads area based on that uh, with our IT folks. They're saying the millennials and those folks are moving into the areas, the urban areas like Seattle. They're moving to Washington, D.C. because they want to be where the action is. And coming back to the IT folks in Charlottesville still wanting some of those same amenities but also raising children. So they're having a higher cost of, uh, of, of uh, employment because these 30-somethings are coming back where the 20-somethings would be a better mix for them. And so what, we, what we're seeing in, in our area is a move even in Greene County and some other counties working towards that new urbanism. Uh, in the rural areas so that we can, because we're close enough to Charlottesville and those areas to attract uh, and, and work on those anchors like IT. In fact, we're working on a hospital project right now. And I think that you're absolutely right, sir. You're absolutely right. You're going to get it from both ends. You're going to get the millennials. You're going to get the, uh, the baby boomers. And they're both going to go in the same area. I don't think the, the millennials are going to move out. I don't think that they are that type of people. You, you see 16 and 17-year-olds not wanting cars. What 16-year-old does not want a car? <laughs> not now. Thank you. It, you know, it's interesting as, as you all are talking here, but we've all talked about the boomers, we've all talked about the millennials, and the one that's getting squeezed out is this X generation, um, which is really the one between the millennials and the boomers. And those are the ones that sometimes are buying those single-family homes. Those are in their 40s and, and going forward. So. Um, this thing about whether millennials will go here or not, they don't have it two nickels to rub together. It's going to be that X generation first that will take some of that single family. Then you'll get to the millennials. They're a decade away before they can afford to, to make that shift to residential. So, but the, the, the trouble is that the X generation is a small group, like 45 million of them, versus the 80-some million of, the, of that. So it, there isn't enough demand until those millennials get older. But if you listen to this conversation in the last two hours, no one has ever mentioned those folks right now in the X generation. They're, they're dispensable. Well, um, hey, wait it, a minute. It, <laughs> it, <laughs> we, we had a, um, another comment about, you said that the brokerage community, how many less? I think you'll see 30% less brokers by the end of the decade. What do you, is that gonna, what's the deal? What do you, what, how, do, how are you decade gonna offset it? What do you think about that? Jim, do you see yourself losing a job? Uh, Jim McVeigh of Commonwealth Commercial. We made a point, I think if you look around at the, our faces that in our company these days, we've made a big investment in the younger guys to bring along because we all looked around and we were like, ooh, we're all retiring in the next 10 years. So we need someone to continue the, uh, the legacy. But the one thing I want to say when I said 30 percent, we will lose 30 percent of the ones who are not technologically savvy, not, not strategic in their thinking. We will have the same number of people, but they'll be much more strategists, advisors, and thinking very differently than a transactional type of broker today. That's the switch. I, I sold my house a year ago in Bethesda, and I was determined to do it myself. I went, and they also had this thing called uh, Red, uh, Red Fen, and it was a, kind of a semi-do-it-yourself brokerage firm, and I had Zillow, and I'm on Trulia, and I'm doing all this work. I ended up copping out. I decided to go with Long and Foster, they negotiate commissions up there, and I, I, I wanted that service. I just felt uncomfortable. Too many moving parts, too complicated, uh, but yet the technology. How, do you, how are you guys uh, using the technology to keep up with this? Sydney, I think uh, there's a ton of people that do it residential. They use the Zillow, they yeah. use the Realtor.com, and I think, it, I think at some point the commercial and industrial is going to start leaning toward the technology and the internet and the iPhone and 
Um, that's where the service piece and, and the selling of the, uh, the service as opposed to just kind of transactional transaction, I think it's going to be the service and the technology where the, 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 the folks in the room are going to have to step up. Yeah, you know, it's a apartment people you may find in the future are going to be may be more valued by the number of, of connective points they have versus the asset that they might have. The average person has 270 Facebook or LinkedIn kind of relationships. If you take a, a, a two unit, two people in a unit, that's almost 500, 600, peop, 600 potential links that you get out of that one unit. Then times 300 units, and you can just see we're talking hundreds of thousands and ultimately millions of people that you can connect with. And so as that begins to happen, it's the access to people. That's what Amazon wants. That's what eBay wants. That's what all of the major internet drivers want connective points. Multifamily will have an incredible value if they can manage the data points inside their facilities. And the same is going to apply to, to the other users as well. Retail will go on and so will some of the commercial. So this is a battle about access. That's what Apple is trying to do, get into your, you know, your phone and, and your computer. And, 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 and the rest of them are trying to get into your TV. I mean, all of this is about controlling access and data points to buy ultimately through the internet all your services. And one, all your one, of, one of the things you said in um, that we're going to have a standardized platform, a certified underwriting where it maybe is done in advance, somewhat trying to get it more about, but right now there's so much individual due diligence and you keep doing it over and over for every deal you buy. Do you see that trend? Is that a service component that the... Well, this is only driven by as long as we securitize mortgages and securitize and do much more public auctions and things with real estate, they're going to want to have a certified. Someone's going to say, that person has done it and blessed it before everyone else is going to have to go through their due diligence. That's what's going to cause that securitization to accelerate. Sydney, um, I have a question for the panel. What keeps you all up at night? We've talked about you know, things are going well right now, or maybe in the seventh, eighth inning, but. What happens when the, the ball game's over? Uh, my generation is building no equity. We're renters. We've got student debt, low wage growth. You know, rents continue to increase. I just we're the biggest cohort. I, that that picture doesn't look good there. Uh, so I'm just curious, what keeps you all up at night, and how you're preparing for what could that's could a, be? That's a great yeah. question. Uh, particularly the younger people, they 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 do have the overhang of debt. They're, I assume that you were worried about the future. Uh, the volatility that may be on the horizon, we don't know. What y'all, how do y'all make these, how do y'all make these kind of predictions? How do you control your commitment in debt and capital so we avoid what happened the last time around? We're, we're uh, old enough to remember that pretty well. I remember, remember several of them. Comments? Don't get over leverage. Yeah, I don't but think you're gonna... Is it you taking a smaller part <laughs> of the deal? I mean, I know you say don't go to over leverage, but every time we have a real estate boom, we were over leveraged. Uh, what, is, what, okay. Is this different? Mm -hmm. and, until the older founders who drank the Kool Aid and always overbuilt are gone, that will occur. But as you get more and more stringent capital requirements, lenders and equity partners are becoming more and more stringent on what's going on that will cause that not to be overbuilt as much as it was in the past. Remember, a lot of that was driven by this boomer wave. And right now, we're not seeing that activity going forward here. So it's the adaptive reuse, it's the mixed use, it's the redevelopment, it's the re portfolio, re rebalancing the portfolios, it's changing that nature. But the, remember, too, is that today we are less in control of our futures so much goes on, what's going on in the Middle East, what goes on in the capital markets in China, what goes on in Japan, what goes on in the price of oil. All these things have, a, have an impact that we are much flatter Earth than we were 15, 20 years ago, and that's going to have an impact right. on all the things that we do. How many out here, are, well, we have a question right here. Um, Let's get your mic. It see, uh, a lot of your conversation is just colored with it, uh, the concept of age. And, um, you know, medical technology seems to have put another 20 years on 
the 75 year olds and now you got guys of my age and maybe some of your all's age that are looking at their 85 and 90 year old parents and having to take care of them and the pressures that that puts on them um, do you all see that as uh, changing uh, the world that, that we live in and the real estate world that you live in and the, some of the uh, fastest growing real estate is in senior housing congregate care nursing care dementia centers Alzheimer's centers that's where your parents end up going when you no longer they can care for themselves that doesn't generally happen until they're in their 80s right or more and so that's right now some of them are in that category and that's why it's skyrocketing I could say so, but so, but medical medical technology today as opposed to 50 years ago you know people are living to be 95 and 100 years old and um, it just seems like that that's, well, that's putting going to change social security on you that's right and that seems to be <laughs> what, putting what, a lot what of we want to do is tax the young people more and have them take care of us when we're older <laughs> that's true yeah. that's exactly right Yes, sir. Hi, Chris. Question um, on your predictions. Gr great presentation, by the way. But I noticed one big hole. You have nothing in there about primary and secondary school education and the changes in that. That's about 50% of the local budgets. In education? Here. Primary and secondary school education. We built right. big $100 million high schools. Uh, they cost a lot to keep up. I mean, look at the city of Richmond and what they have to reinvest in deferred maintenance. I think that I, I will tell you that I absolutely believe that the future of this country is based on how well we can educate. Um, well, well, I understand that. So I go back to Galen's idea about 80,000 bank branches, and I would think that maybe some end of large computer training to go into local branches versus big high schools. But I think, I, th I think that's a big issue because a lot of the money for these inf infrastructure programs you're talking about are concentrated in these schools. And I know my old neighborhood in Fairfax County, when I was growing up, there were eight elementary schools and four high schools in that area in Mount Vernon today there's one elementary school and one high school left uh, because all the youth growth is moved to the western part of the county so uh, you know if we think all this is going to happen to colleges and universities I think we also have to anticipate some major change there's a, there's in primary and secondary education yeah, there's as well. great statistics out if you go back and look on the internet they call them sticky states um, and you can find out the states that the residents stay longer. You know, they go to high school, they go to college, and they stay in that state. And then you look at the state and see why did they stay there? It's because of the opportunities. It's because of the jobs. It's because of the way that it was structured. So the more we can create reasons to stay and be sticky, the more reasons we'll have for a vi more vibrant educational system rather than get out and go someplace else. That's that's the risk that every state and every city has, is to try to keep that. And people still uh, make decisions when they have children where they want to locate uh, for schools. I hear about this flip uh, classroom concept, the Khan Academy on online. I mean, maybe that's, I agree with you. I think that's, I think the public school systems could be under increasing pressure by alternatives, not necessarily the private schools as we know it, but more online schools and different roles that they can play. I don't. Well, education's changing anyway. They're, they're teaching by game techniques now. You know, it's not the way we might have learned, read a chapter, get a test, you know. It, they're using more interactive training, much more training, which can be done more in, online. It can be done with computers and technology. So um, it, it's just, you really got to invest in the young people in this community. Perfect. Um, and you really got to continue to invest in, the, in their welfare because that, that is the future of this, of this community. Thank you. And I, and I think, Sydney, the, the, the K through 12, model uh, in terms of additional infrastructure and improving what we've got. Um, I, I see that as something that's going to change, not tomorrow or next year, but out in the future. Because you talk about the 24-hour, the 18-hour uh, use, I think schools are going to become more of a center for that type of thing, particularly the high schools. And um, the money to pay for those new schools and improvements to old schools, uh, again, I think it's going to be a combination of the resources that you were talking about in terms of of equity in, in addition to They're falling apart. I mean, my experience with government is they love to uh, build the new schools. They like to spend the capital money. They like, as I said, kiss the babies and cut the ribbons, but they don't want to, they can't, ma they're not maintaining like they should be. Next question, Ruben. Uh, thank you, Sydney. Uh, 
back to the changing face in the real estate brokerage in the next 20 years. In the Metro of Richmond, I've got two questions actually. If you, do you see, do we need, or will we have a need going forward in the real estate umbrella, the true bilingual broker agent who can negotiate in Spanish a complex commercial or industrial type lease? There are industrial, I mean, there are residential brokers, but in that commercial market, I've not seen that many advertising that they hold themselves out or she to negotiate that complex lease for a bilingual client. And the second part would be if you assume the industrial revolution took labor off the form and the technology revolution took labor out of the manufacturing plant and we're now in an era of the robotics going forward, will we by bringing more efficiency, create surplus labor for which there are no known jobs for in the future. Thank you. Yeah. Who wants to take that on? Will we, will we be being replaced by robots? The answer is yes. We are going to have uh, millions and millions of Americans not working because they cannot find work. Um, and that is going to happen from robotics, so we have to find ways in which they can be productive in whether it's community service activities, education, training, I, I mean, I variety totally of things. disagree with you. I think you're crazy. I will tell you something. <laughs> uh, I, think, I think that's a kind of a Malthusian premise. I think that uh, we've been saying that for 200 years. I think the robots will create much higher productivity, but there's an insatiable demand for stuff. We may become more service oriented. We've got to fix the robots. We've got to invent the robots. But I, don't, I think the robots become one of the ultimate tools we'll see. But the history has been technology creates a better standard all, of living. All I would suggest to you is next time you visit uh, 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 Germany, go to the BMW factory there and you'll see 50 people manufacturing cars. They used to have 5,000 people trying to push those things out. It is totally automated and they're pushing out BMWs every minute. They um, will have to be re-educated and they may do something creating apps or being more educational online. I, I but agree, but, but in terms of it's replacing, and, and this is where education comes and other things. When you can, now you came and order food at a McDonald's or something else, they just push pictures and things. We, we, we haven't even got in, they can't even make their own change. You know, it becomes robotic in the way that which we, are, we are, are, are taking some of these young, talented people here. So I worry about that. I'll tell you who we could replace with a robot, it's Vince. This is just lots of numbers on computers. <laughs> I mean, we already got computers, <laughs> Vince. Um, I was getting ready to say that I agree with you, Sydney, and now, <laughs> now I'm it's changing too. Yeah, so okay. I agree that some, somebody's got to invent the robot. Somebody's got to, my experience with robots, technology, computers, you got to fix them. They're down. You've got help desk. I mean, I, I mean maybe there's somewhere, maybe there's somewhere in the middle. Could there's you even nobody that can replace a good consultant on tax Keep strategies. saying that over and over. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but, That's what Gabriel was what? talking about, the branch bank stuff. That's why they're not necessary. It's all technology. Right. right. I may invent some sort of tax filing app for the phone. And then I'm not worried about you, Vince, because every time you say you're going to simplify it, you end up charging me more and it gets more complicated. <laughs> it, it, is this, it is so complex, I don't even understand. I quit even asking questions. Just where do I sign? Yeah. Um, it's a, it's a trick. The, the, the issue, Sydney, is what we need jobs. We need nurses. We need tech, tech people. We need a variety of people in that area. But someone who's 50, 55 and been in manufacturing is not trainable or does not desire to be trainable for the last five or seven years of their quote work life that's the transition we're in right now before you get to i disagree with you again i mean let me tell you i have a very he's good friend of mine huh? you're you're in the category he's bad now yeah i am bad. Um, i have a very good friend of mine that ran a major insurance national insurance company he ran the virginia division he retired at 50 seven years old, he is now 67. He repurposed himself and has become an unbelievable expert and citywide spokesman on farming. He and his wife, way out in Goochland, they make, uh, for example, I'll tell you what it is they make. The sole source of ginger for Hardywood 
ginger stout beer, which is now one of the top 100 beers in the country. And I said to Bill, Bill and India Cox, I said, Bill, how do you take a vacation? I was at his farm last week. I mean, he works day and night. He said he's repurposed himself. He's taught himself. He loves what he's doing. And he says, Sydney, I am on vacation. But so the issue, the issue of in our lifespan, do we, do, we, uh, do we really retire like we used to the 65 or we repurpose ourselves and, and find something else to do? Because I mean, that's going to affect everything we do off the scale. Economically, you're going to have to work over 65 to survive most people in this country. By necessity. By necessity. Now, you, we need a purpose, but by... Yeah. There, so, so I mean, I think absolutely right. There's a big public policy sort of question that none of us can solve, I suspect, in, inherent in this conversation. Your friend, well-educated, capable of doing that. The problem is that's a percentage of the population. The good news is, I think millennials, a lot, a lot more education, um, but there's a, there is a, a big percentage of the population that, that trying to re-educate themselves is probably a unlikely occurrence. You guys, you guys have the frontline view, are we underfunded to retire? When will we fund to retire? I mean, this is in all the ads on TV. You, but you got the inside, you got access to the books. What's going on? Well, in general, we're absolutely underfunded. I mean, that, that, that's probably not a, you know, a fair statement if you take a, a certain sample. But in general, absolutely we are it in this country. To, it goes back to one of the questions on somebody that doesn't have equity and, and what do we do in 20 years and making sure that you're building that nest egg and, you know, keep control of the project but use somebody else's money. That way you're... Do we, do we have other questions? Ken? I got um, one for... I guess both Chris and Brad. Chris, I thought you made a pretty bold prediction on retail. I'm just curious as to your thoughts as to how, how do the office depots and the office maxes, and even Walmart for that matter, how do those get repopulated? Well, I don't think Walmart's going anywhere. <laughs> um, if you're asking what, what are the shopping centers going to look like? Yeah, what happens? Um, I, I think the answer is a little bit over here too. I think you'll see community uses. Um, I think you'll see um, multifamily. I think you'll see corporate uh, facilities being taken over there. Um, some of the shopping centers that are being developed or redeveloped now are being apartment buildings. Um, you know, with that inner courtyard and all the gardens and things that happen there. Um, it just, it, it, to me, it creates opportunities along the way. Um, but. We have way too many big boxes of, of retail right now. They're going to really struggle. Unless you're Dollar General. Others, other questions, please. Yes, sir. We're at historic low cap rates, historic low interest rates. Ryan, how do you underwrite to that in a three to five year time frame? And is that going to be the catalyst for the end of our 10 year cycle? Rates going up. Uh, that certainly could be one of the reasons the, the real estate cycle ends. We, we generally, when we underwrite transactions, are, are budgeting for 100 basis points of expansion on our reversion cap rate. So what we're expecting as interest rates go up, and cap rates are correlated with that, and, and cap rates are going to be higher three to five years from now. Other questions? Cindy, what do you think is going to happen to the, uh, the health care industry after the war babies pass through? Who's that question for? Anybody up there? Anybody? What was the question? Health, health care. Where do you see that going? Uh, I think that was a question. Af the after the war babies pass through. I think the forecast is, is for an incredible amount of dock in the box facilities. Um, I think you'll see nurses, practitioners that will take over a lot of the health care needs that you're going to see, but you'll have a lot more community, non hospital related places to come in and get blood pressure and, and x rays and that stuff by nurse practitioners, and not doctors. Um, and you'll also see there are already technologies today that people can put in apartments and stuff where you can measure your, your, your heart, your pulse, your whatever. It's a smart technology that you'll almost have your living, your living unit and your, your Apple phone and your, and your, and your uh, PDA is going to tell you your health condition and that will go right, right. to the hospital and that will be able to tell you what's going on and it will be all be without having to do medical. I have one more question but I'm going to pick on somebody just for the fun of it. Tommy Davis. Tell me how you see the construction industry. Uh, how is it reacting to all this? 
Is it is it on fire? Do you? What's your view? Uh, <laughs> not fair, Sydney. Not fair. I know it's not fair. Uh, I, I I I concentrate a lot in, re in retail, and um, I'm I'm seeing supermarkets go crazy. Go crazy. Um, I'm working for Super Value, and I hold and probably seven or eight supermarkets going on huge right amount now. of supermarkets a lot going now. on right now um, seeing a lot on the college campuses with their multi where their dorms care. but the, the retail is, is going nuts. the retail right now is hot it's going nuts uh, thank you that that'll be the end of the questions I, I'd like to make a comment before we uh, wrap up here um, this is the sixth annual real estate forum by Commonwealth Commercial. And I just want to let you know that I have uh, thoroughly enjoyed working with them, not only on the last three years of this forum, forum, but using them as a client of theirs. And when we looked, I'm doing a shopping center down in uh, Southside, and when we looked for who we wanted to work with, we wanted somebody that was absolutely fully transparent, full disclosure, and focused on the client, particularly in the landlord context. And it's been a great relationship, and uh, we have fully loved it. I will tell you, uh, what's amazing, I remember when Mark Claude uh, and others created Commonwealth Commercial, and they were down off of um, Parham, wasn't it before, Forest Avenue? Forest Avenue, 1996, not many people. Today, they have been growing at a huge rate, with this type of mentality, this boutique mentality, this boutique orientation, but with a national approach as far as systems. They're trying to carve a niche out that the other large companies are not doing. Today they are in six states. They have 400 people. I know beyond the, the real estate and the asset management aspect, uh, they are tied in with Ryan and Lingerfeld Development uh, in an institutional investment platform. They've gone into hotels. What have I, anything else? What, have you done something? No, I think, I think hotels are Is that it? That's today. keeping <laughs> you busy? I know they have put in huge sums of money into, uh, uh, into their growth and into their investments, conservative investments in the context of how they place their institutional financing. And I think it's a much more conservative way to avoid um, our feeding at the trough, because if Galen would lend the money, we would borrow it. Um, <laughs> At this point, I'd like to uh, turn it over to Ken Strickler. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Ken Strickler. I am the Director of Asset Management at, at Commonwealth Commercial. And as another engaging forum comes to a close, I'd like to take the time to thank our panelists, uh, Galen Layfield with Zenith Bank, uh, Chuck Wall, with Troutman Sanders, uh, Vince Nader with Kyder Stevens, Brad Sauer with Sauer Properties, Ryan Lingerfeld with Lingerfeld Commonwealth, and um, I'd like to um, invite uh, Sydney Guns, our moderator, and Chris Lee, our speaker, to come forward. Got a gift for you, it's keys to a new car. <laughs> I like that. Free and clear? Five-year loan. <laughs> Galen's going to finance. Yeah, bad news is I got the title, Sydney. Got the title. <laughs> Thank you very much. I Thank appreciate it. I've enjoyed much. doing this. Hope you all have had a good time. <laughs> last but not least, thanks to everyone in the audience for attending. I'd like to encourage everyone to please uh, stick around for the reception immediately following. Um, and let's continue the engaging discussion. Uh, enjoy. Have a great uh, evening. Thanks again. <laughs> <laughs>